something is happening and they're just not quite part of it. And so I think, I don't think it's just you or even just left brain Mm -hmm. people. I think it's, especially too, in the world we live in, the entertainment we have at our fingertips, like we're able to choose what we want. So if we've chosen to sit in this room with everyone, Mm -hmm. they want it. They want something. There's an expectation. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's, sometimes I think it's a matter of marketing and then sometimes I think it's a matter of, like, framing a show, giving it a theme or something. Mm-hmm. Like, like I like the ones where, what was it? Um, I believe it's, um, I just talked to Tyler Lane about uh, Channel 2, and they were talking about how they do, like, a genre. So their suggestion is based on a genre. But the genres aren't just like, hey, give me a genre. They each come up with one and then kind of pitch it, mm-hmm. and then the audience picks one of the pitches, which is an excellent way to control mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Because that way, um, and I would definitely not suggest in any way, like, pre-planning what you're going to do for each pitched genre, but mm-hmm. it certainly helps not have, like a horrible, weird, creepy thing that an audience member may have said thinking they're hilarious Mm -hmm. and really, like, they've now backed you into a corner of, like, pimps and hoes or something. Or, like, or, like, some weird, like, you're like, um, okay, no thank you. Like, it'd be like, uh, let's try something that's not going to be deeply offensive. Because there's a lot of weird things people can say. Mm -hmm. So to help hone what they can receive the suggestion can certainly help. Well, and I I actually took a lot of classes over at Hideout. I graduated their program, and I'm still pretty active over there. And I love their narrative style. And they're very big on having some genres selected ahead of time, or maybe a theme. Um, And I actually have a troupe, Soundstage 23. We're a musical improv troupe. And we usually come in with some kind of genre or theme in hand. uh, But we ask the audience for the title of a movie that they've never seen. And so on one hand, for me, coming from New Movement, where you were taught to have zero suggestion going into it, you make everything up the second you're on stage which is improv, but uh, having that element of that genre, it's kind of nice because it gets you guys all on the same page to where you can almost be more open and confident in just letting yourself go and letting whatever comes out of your mouth come out because you know you're already on the same page with at least one thing. And then having that title of the movie is fun because it really gives the audience a way to be a part of it. Uh, And then you can take and interpret that thing however you want. And we've had some real wonky... We had a... We did a nun show musical once. Uh, we did Harry Potter, an improvised Harry Potter show. We've done Christmas themes. I mean, we've done so much fun stuff. How do you like the narrative? Um, because I, years ago, I had a, a musical improv troupe uh, called Water Park, and we tried to do narrative shows, though none of us were trained at the hideout, though we probably should have been, um, <laughs> trying to find a way into story. We always had a problem with, like, the end, like, wrapping it up. Mm-hmm. Um, have you, and you, you don't have to talk about wrapping it up, but uh, with reference to doing narrative improv, how do you find the journey is? Is it easy for, easier for you? Are there things you've learned that have helped you get around the bumps? Yeah, you know, I find narrative extremely difficult. And again, I come from, I really like UCB style. I, I'm naturally more of a game player. Hmm. Uh, but And when I first started narrative, I hated it. I never wanted to take another narrative class, and I swore <laughs> I was just going to do it to get through Hideout. Uh, But by the end of that narrative class and actually doing some narrative shows, I really came to love it. Uh, And I find that musical narratives are actually a little bit easier because you can travel pretty far in a song that you can't do without the music. So, like, for example, the middle of that show, a 30-minute narrative, that's hard to do. I mean, you got to go, you got to display a want, you got to set the scene, you got to have something go wrong, you got to see that person dealing with wrongdoings, they've got to suddenly find a way to be right, save everyone, wrap it up, maybe have a kiss. Yeah. And in 30 minutes, that's a lot. And it's nice to have those songs in there to be able to have kind of a traveling montage of walking, watching that person, you know, get beat up and then get back up and uh, find the girl, save the girl, all in one song. Yeah. But uh, non-musical narratives, I still think, are extremely challenging. But I think when mm. you do a good one, it's so rewarding. Oh, yeah. I mean... If you can make it happen in a truly improv way, it's like, oh, uh, I've just touched God. Like, yeah, because it's like stories are unreal to mm-hmm. create this unreal thing. Because the narrative, we all like to um, imagine that our own lives are a narrative, but really they're not. Like, they're our own narrative, mm-hmm. but we don't know. There's no wrap up ending in our own lives mm-hmm. in the same way that, like, we want 
television and movies and, and improv scenes to be like, oh, I feel com- complete. There's a bow. Um, so, man, if you can really get that. Oh, it's so rewarding. It is like. Well, and that's why I love the Herald, too. So, like, a montage. To me, a montage show is the funnest show, but it's the least gratifying because at the end you just did a bunch of shit. Maybe it wrapped up. Maybe it didn't. Yeah. And, again, I haven't really done good montages, clearly. Uh, <laughs> but that's one of the reasons I love the Herald is because the Herald's challenging, but in theory it should all wrap up in the end and have some kind of closure where suddenly all these worlds and scenes are kind of coming together at the very top and, or at the very end, and I love that. Yeah, I um, I like it too, but just because my like initial um, obsession with comedy came through sitcoms, mm-hmm. and I, uh, I believe the Herald format is used a lot of times in sitcoms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, isn't it always sunny? Uh, I was told that was a I Herald believe so. I believe so. Um, I don't watch It's Always Sunny, so I, I can't speak to it. But, um, uh, like, Seinfeld is. Is it? Is Curb, too? Curb Your Enthusiasm? I believe so. I mean, they're written pretty much the same way. So, um, But, yeah, if you watch... Like, with Seinfeld, the reason why there's four characters is because three, the, three of them are the path and one of them is the game. Mm-hmm. And usually Kramer's the game. Mm-hmm. Like, so you just follow along. They each do weird shit. We meet back in the house. They talk about it. We go back out. We do more weird shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's very... But even though it's, like... As simple as just going on a date and that's the beat. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, that's why I love I love Harold because it makes people feel like they're going to create an insane amount of things when really it can be so manageable. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm such a uh, structured person. Mm-hmm. Like, so I, I really appreciate, like, what you're saying about, like, how Harold is more satisfying mm-hmm. than um, Montage. Um, I like Montage in an educational way. Mm-hmm. I feel like it is excellent for throwing stuff against the wall and trying to make it work and not worrying about where it starts or where it ends, like just being sort of free and easy about it. Mm -hmm. Um, But man, when I'm creating stuff, I am total structure. I mean, everything I've ever done, I've like read up on and then figured, found something that matched the setup and then um, built the structure from that. Like Mm -hmm. sometimes I'll read books on structure, but I have a hard time getting through those books. Mm -hmm. So instead I just find something I like and then put it down on paper. Like I'll get a script. Like I taught myself how to write a screenplay by finding a copy of a screenplay that I liked Mm -hmm. and then just reading it and taking notes about what was happening. Oh, wow. Um, And then I bought a structure book because apparently that's a big deal. And I wanted to have a reference book to be like, oh, crap, this is happening. Well, how do I (laughs) how do I notate it? And it's like three and, you know, three tabs. And then, you know, it's like, what the hell? But (laughs) they're very particular. That's funny. Um, But yeah, for me, it's like I love the structure. If I can understand and wrap my mind around it like myself, Mm -hmm. it's almost it's almost like for me, I learned more about improv teaching it than I have performing it. You know what? That is so true. I haven't done a ton of teaching. I've done a little bit of directing. Uh, but just naturally by, you know, I've, I've graduated a bunch of the programs here in Austin. And I find that I'm in a troupe that's associated with, G- with each theater. And I like to, like, bring little tidbits of knowledge that I've learned at other theaters in. And I found that by kind of focusing on being decent at those things, since I'm encouraging others in the troupe to try it out, too, I've gotten much better at it just by teaching it to others. Or you know what else I learn a lot from is watching people get taught. Uh, I've been stage managing a show at uh, Hideout right now called Orphans. It's an improvised orphan musical, and it's amazing. Fun. Um, and it's it's full of, you know, 20 of my favorite improvisers at that theater. And watching them uh, do what I see as perfect improv and then receive notes on it from the directors has been such a great learning experience. Because uh, you almost see, you know, when you're an improviser like me that's been doing this maybe three years... You're good enough to do stuff, but you're not good enough to be receiving the higher level notes and understanding of why you've learned certain rudimentary habits. Mm. And seeing some of these higher level improvisers receiving notes on their already high level improv uh, has helped me understand, like, oh, that's why they made that rule in level three. Oh, like, that's why I want to move in factions with uh, groups of people instead of have us all linearly trying to make a seven-person scene make sense. In fact, that was actually, I would say, the coolest thing I've learned this year is I always struggled in big troops. You know, if there's six people on stage, really hard to manage that. And it's really hard to know what other people are thinking on stage. And just the other day at Hideout, they were teaching about factions, how you know, get into two or three perspectives by clumping together and holding the same perspective as your little group. 
And that, to me, I mean, that might sound so simple, but that was mind-blowing to me. No, that's one of my favorite roles ever. Oh, I, my gosh. I, I actually am, um, uh, they're, they're lovely to offer three. I When I teach level one, I say two points of view, and that's it. Mm-hmm. I got, I want to hear more than two points of view. Somebody walks in and says, I like cookies, and the second person says, I don't like cookies. The scene's about how you, you like or you just like cookies. That's all the scene's about. Mm-hmm. Like, have crazy opinions about that particular weird, singular opinion, mm-hmm. but don't make, don't be the third one who's like, I don't know, I could be convinced. Mm-hmm. No one cares. It's too much. Well, we've been, so I'm in a uh, monopop troupe, so that's my new favorite form. Is uh, Yeah, tell me about that. I, um, I've i heard people referring to this, so I don't know exactly what it is. What's a monopop? It's great. We do it in, a, my troupe's called Garage, where every Wednesday at 8 over at 616 Lavaca. Mm-hmm. And it's basically, we do about a 25-minute mono scene, but the difference is whenever something fun or funny or just something you want to see comes up in a conversation between whatever characters on stage... Uh, we will wave them off, and we want to see whatever that thing was. So if someone says, you know, don't you remember what used to happen, you know, at work back when you worked at Enron? And immediately if someone heard that, we'd go straight to Enron and see, you know, five to ten line scene of what that was like. And it can be so fun. It reminds me a lot of Family Guy, actually. Yeah. There's cutbacks, flash twos. And to me, that's fun. Because I like the groundedness of having a mono scene, but I like the creativity and punchiness of being able to cut to whatever the heck you want to see. Yeah. And blend any kind of devices you want to see. Scene painting, uh, wave-offs, or even, like, we've had God voice come in. God has made a couple of guest appearances in our shows, sure. which is really fun. <laughs> How did you guys come to that? Did you have a coach that suggested it, or did some? Did you guys come in together and say... This is a style we want to do together? No, so uh, Yamina actually came up with it back when she was artistic director there, um, and she really wanted to have an all-women mono scene troupe or monopop troupe. Um, and so she put it together, she casted it, there were aud- auditions, uh, oh. and we had our first show, I think, last June or May, and we've gone every Wednesday since then. And it's been fun to watch the progress. We really didn't have a ton of rehearsals, so when you get you know seven or eight women on a stage together... It can be a little bit hard to figure out how to manage that many people on one small stage, but I'd say, as of a couple months ago, I think we've really nailed it Yeah. on how to manage that. Yeah, group scenes can be the hardest, like when you feel like you have a larger group, but I feel like it's better to have more people available versus fewer, because mm-hmm. I've had a lot of, um, I'm not going to say sad, because I loved my tiny little level ones, but I've had classes that have whittled down to like four or five Mm -hmm. like just in the last few classes like where it's like too late to cancel Mm -hmm. like though I have had one recently where it was like on the second to last class two people quit leaving two left and I was like I'm terribly sorry we are not going to keep going with this class with two people only but years ago they'd already paid for it and everything I mean there just wasn't anything to do the people that were it was like two people who, if they did a show by themselves, right. it would have been a very unusual sort of situation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. No, it was all a little weird, and yeah. Um, it, it can be difficult. I think I think people got refunds, honestly. I mean, it was only like one class, but I think one guy asked for it, so he was like, okay. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, it's just, it's so hard to do it with too few people. Right. Like, um because you want them to be able to experience it. It's also real scary. And so to have only two people means mm-hmm. that you're holding all of the weight. Right. Oh, gosh, you're in I'm every still... scene doing everything you have to edit from within. And which is a tough thing for noobs. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't like to make them do, they'll ask me, can I do it? And I go, you can, but keep in mind, it's real hard to do. Mm-hmm. Like you need to be, you need to understand how to have your brain inside the scene and outside the scene at the same time. And I just don't know that level one's the time when you're developing that skill. Gosh, I'm, I mean, I'll edit from inside a scene, but I'm still scared to do duo improv. I mean, I've done a few, oh, but sure. I don't know what it is about that. That is just so difficult. I think it's like, you know, it's nice to, like I said, it's nice to have other people around in mm-hmm. case, because I don't think either you or myself or most of the people we know are very scared individuals, but I've a hundred percent been on the side of the stage and then just been like, I literally have no ideas. My brain isn't empty. Right. I have nothing. And in those moments I will 
I, I'll try to push myself. Like, it's like, if I get a blank slate brain, I go, oh, it's time to go in. Yep. Because it's like, who knows what I'll say. Right. Like, it could be horrifying, but I'm trying. I'm going to do my best. Yeah. And, I, you know, I like, I personally like playing support roles more than main roles, which is kind of interesting because... 